Craig. I have the extreme honor of serving as your MC today. We have a mystery in the house now. Speaking of mysteries, we have some non-EAH members here, including one who is very familiar. Okay, if you could introduce yourself. I'm Lori Lloyd, Alan Lloyd's daughter. And my husband, Bill Leary, will be your speaker. Okay, thank you, thank you. There are no further announcements or unannouncements. Mr. Introducer, please introduce <laughs> Today, we sail with Bill Noodle Leary as he sails in the wake of Captain Cook, Abel Tasman, and in fact, in the wake of his own father, Bob Leary, who sailed with Irving Johnson as first mate of the schooner Yankee. It was one of the Yankees' three trips around the world. His father had just replaced Sterling Hayden as the first mate, and for this cruise, they s sailed extensively in the Pacific Islands, islands of mystery at the time, islands like Tarawa, which just a few years later, Bill's father returned to Tarawa as a captain of a Navy LST to land Marines at the Battle of Tarawa. So you can see the Learys have, uh, their DNA has sailing in it. I guess I should clear, clear up the, the nickname issue. People usually think Bill's nickname, Noodle, has some interesting sea tale or sea story attached to it. But I am told that it came from his school days studying for engineering exams, often up into the late hours of the night. In those days, Bill virtually lived on cup noodle. And it was the loud slurping of the noodles heard by his dorm mates down the hall that earned him the nickname Noodle. So, <laughs> with that taken care of, um, now I <clears throat> want to stop and give Noodle as much time as possible to take us 10,000 miles across the sea to the land that time forgot, Tasmania. Thank you, Mac. After f 50 years, I finally learned why I was named Noodle. <laughs> okay. So today I'm going to talk about Van Diemen's, that's the name of the boat, uh, Trans-Pacific Voyage uh, last year. We went from Newport Beach, California to Tasmania, uh, 10,500 miles in six months. This is a picture that was taken uh, in the Lao group of the Fiji Islands. Okay, so why was I involved in the, in the trip? Uh, 42 years ago, I did the Los Angeles to Tahiti yacht race, and I sailed with a guy named Rob Vaughn. This is Rob driving the boat that I was uh, racing on. Uh, Rob was my watch captain, and he was a professional skipper of the boat, and we became pretty close friends. A year later, um, I was with Rob again, this time aboard Windward Passage, which is a pretty famous ocean racing boat. We sailed from Tasmania through a, a, a tropical a cyclone in the Coral Sea and then up to Palau. Uh, I took this picture south of Tasmania and I'm retired now, lots of time on my hands, so I'm scanning my slides into uh, digital format and I scanned this slide, uh, tracked Rob down and emailed it to him. That's Rob in the white there driving the boat. I thought it was a pretty good picture. And we started a dialogue between us. Rob said, hey, I'm gonna be sailing my boat uh, back to Tasmania in a couple of years. Do you wanna come along? And I always wanted to sail with my old friend and mentor again, so I signed up for the trip. A Van Diemen is, she's 64 feet on deck. I guess overall she'd be 70-something uh, if you count the bowsprit. But this is Van Diemen. She's a, a wooden sloop built in New Zealand in 2005 for Rob, custom-built boat. Uh, it's a very fast cruising boat. Uh, it's a very traditional above the waterline, but underwater she's uh, very modern with a fin keel and a spade rudder. Carbon fiber mast and, and just a uh, very quick modern boat. This is the path we took from, from Newport Beach. We went down to the Marquesas, Two Motus, Society Islands, Rarotonga, Nui, Tonga, Fiji, New Caledonia, and then into the Coral Sea where we went to Norfolk Island, Lord Howe Island before the coast of Australia, and then down to Tasmania. Here's a video I put together of our passage to the Marquesas. This is a tour of the boat here. And now for a more leisurely tour of the inside of the good ship Van Diemen. Uh, 
coming down below, Beth had a spinnaker up there. This is the four peak on Van Diemen, where we keep all our sails, anchors, and that kind of gear. Washing machine that is currently in the middle of doing a load. I have never been on a boat with a washing machine before. This is a first for me. This boat had a washing machine, first boat I've ever been on that has a washing machine. And she was right in the middle of a load right there. Salt water? Uh, no, it uses fresh water. We had a water maker on the boat. This is the workbench area here with tools and spares and a workbench to do stuff. Behind this door right there is a, is a head. Let's take, let's take a quick look at that head. This is the guest, guest cabin head. See, we've got a toilet back here and here's the guest cabin. It's a double cabin. Bill Bars is living in here right now. And turning around and heading aft, this is the crew cabins where I live. It has upper and lower bunks. I'm keeping my junk on the lower bunk and I'm living here on the upper bunk. More guest cabin. Working our way aft. There's a small head where we take our showers. Day, day head. Rob's cabin, master cabin over here on the right. See his master cabin, big bed. His bathroom. That's a bathtub there with all that stuff in it. it hardly ever gets used. And galley now. Three big ice boxes. One, two, three in the back. Stove. Uh, the, most of that, yeah, that's teak. All the varnish stuff is teak, and the, the sole of the boat, that's teak and holly. Yeah, what would estimated cost of a boat like this? That would be, this boat is, would be well over a million dollars. So, yeah. The center of the boat has a double sink. And back to the great cabin, or the saloon. Rob's working on something like he always is. Nav station. We're getting the radio going. Yep, Rob's getting the radio going. And uh, saloon with a table where we eat. Real nice place. You can sit there, look out the windows. You can see the, the uh, horizon as we're zipping along here. And then up on the top here comes Mike. Bill, Bill Barr's driving. Nice big cockpit. No fish today, but there's always hope. And we, in fact, we didn't catch very many fish the whole trip. Uh, that you catch in the old days, in the 70s, when I first started doing this, you'd put a line over, you'd get fish, and uh, nowadays you don't hardly catch anything. So, there's less fish out there. We're absolutely, well, probably, well, definitely before our kids' lifetime is over, there'll be no more fish out there. We're, we're, we're not making any effort to. In the middle of nowhere. That's, yeah, I've. Eight, they're everywhere. I, on one trip to Tahiti, I encountered eight fishing boats in the middle of nowhere. So if you see eight, that means there's there's 8,000 of them out there and they're catching everything. So, and there's, we're, we're not making any attempt to regulate it. Uh, mostly long lines, long lines, yeah. And up on deck, looking towards the Marquesas. Of course, we crossed the equator and uh, we had two guys that hadn't been across before. Uh, there's King Neptune in the, in the middle after our initiation ceremony. Always a lot of fun across the equator. Uh, after 15 and a half days, we made our first uh, landfall at uh, Fatu Hiva, which is the southeasternmost of the Marquesas Islands. And it's, this is the Bay of Virgins there, Hanavave in, in Fatu Hiva, one of the prettiest spots on the planet. Uh, and of course, you can see the other cruising boats at anchor here. Uh, it, everyone leaves the west coast at the same time to cross the uh, South Pacific during their winter months because you want to avoid hurricane season down there. So this is the cruising fleet at anchor there. This, this is the island that uh, Thor hired on this, right? That's correct. Yeah, Thor hired He wrote his fir first book called Fatu Hiva about his stay on, on this island. And just a really interesting read if any, no one's ever read that. This is right next to our anchorage there at Fatu Hiva. Usually a coconut tree dies 
Um, either the top of it falls off or it falls over at the base. And it looked to me like this guy just stood there until he couldn't take it anymore and just said, oh, shit, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I've never seen a coconut tree just go limp like that. I had been to the Marquesas before in 1986 on, uh, on my boat, but we missed uh, two of the real gems, which is uh, Uahuka and Uapau. And this is Uapau with the... the the spires up there, and those spires are all the cores of uh, volcanoes that have eroded away, and that's all that's left of them. Just a lovely spot. Um, this is from, we, after two weeks in the Marquesas, we had a two-day sail down to the Tuamotos. We went to two islands there, Manihi and Rangiroa, which is the largest atoll in the world at uh, 550 square miles. This is a video I put together of our stay there in uh, Rangiroa. This is the uh, anchorage just inside Tiputa Pass, Rangiroa, Tuamotu Archipelago. Um, got a bunch of boats in here. This is one of the few spots that's this little peninsula up here shelters uh, boats from the easterly and southeast trades. Just there beyond that boat and that uh, point is the Tiputa Pass, which is the eastern pass into the lagoon. They do drift diving there when there's a flood tide. And panning around to the north now, here on Rangiroa, or you see we're anchored way in here in a good spot. There's sand, but a little bit of coral heads everywhere, but that's okay, we're in sand. And big population here, nice beach. Looking north now. And this, this is a resort with those bungalows over the water. Looking off to the west, other boats behind us, and way down there in the distance is the Avatoru Pass, about five miles. We came in that pass this morning hoping to, because that's where the main town is, but uh, there was no shelter there. That big power boat, um, Ascari, we saw him in, in Tahiti in 2011 and 2014, so that's a well-used motorboat there. And now looking back towards the south. Look at these guys. I don't think they're hungry, do you? These make the these make the Kaneohe Bay manta rays look like babies. Jesus, these are some big boys. We had just come through a section of reefs there, and so we said, "Boy, we th we're we're through the reefs area." And Mike looks up and says, "Well, what about that reef over there?" And I looked over. And I said, "That's not a reef. Those are manta rays. These things were were huge." Here we are exiting the Rangiroa Lagoon through the Avatoru Pass, which is the westernmost pass of the two in uh, Rangiroa. Just entering the deep part of the pass now. And the wind has really backed off. Now we're down, we have about 10 knots of prevailing wind, which is what you hope for here in the tropical South Pacific. Makes it real nice. This is the main town here on the eastern side of the pass. Looking back towards the other pass where we were anchored last night and back out into the lagoon. Just at the tail end of the flood tide. Avatoru Pass. There's the range right there for getting in. Rangiro, you can see that boat up there high and dry. That's somebody who screwed up the entrance. And then up ahead, you can't see it yet, but way up on the bow, there's another boat that also screwed up the entrance up high and dry. We had a quick overnight sail to Tahiti, and we made our landfall at the Tautira Peninsula here on the eastern end of Tahiti Edi. Uh, we, you, this is looking south, so the prevailing wind comes over here from the east, so you can tuck in behind this peninsula. It's very sheltered anchorage. Uh, interestingly enough, the road around Tahiti ends right here at Tautira, and this whole coastline here is uh, fully populated, and everyone commutes by boat because there's no roads there. So we came around the corner after a couple days here and explored this lagoon, just a beautiful, beautiful spot. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about Tahiti because I haven't at previous uh, presentations, so I'm just going to touch on some of the highlights. Uh, we got to Mo'orea, and this is how rich guys with mega yachts entertain themselves. 
except when I'm in Minnesota. Uh, the diving is always spectacular um, in Tahiti. This is shot was taken at the Coral River in Taha. This is a convict tang school. And this is diving with, uh, this is Mike, one of the crew members, diving off of uh, Bora Bora. And some, uh, a school of eagle rays off Bora Bora. Uh, we did have some weather come through. This is a rather nasty looking squall that rolled in off of Huahini. Uh, we made the mistake of uh, staying put one night when we knew a front was coming. Skipper decided to wait and see how bad it was. And at two in the morning, we decided it was bad enough to move. So in, in the rain and the wind, Mike went running up through the hatch and it had been slid shut to keep the rain out and banged his head. So always move during the daylight when you, when you can. Um, off of, this is one of the uh, Motus in the Bora Bora Lagoon. We found this, this poor guy had, had a 35 foot boat sunk there. Must have, must have happened about a, within a week of our arrival because we dove on the wreck and there wasn't any marine growth on the, even moss on the mass underwater there. So he must have just gone down. So his, this some poor, yeah, it's very stable, but some poor guy's cruising dream ended right there. We're not sure why it sank. I mean, it, yeah, hard to tell. There was definitely a hole in the hull, though. After we spent about a month in French Polynesia and then headed west to Rarotonga, and this is the only harbor in Rarotonga. This is Avatiu Harbor, looking looking to the south. So it's open to the north. You can see the surf breaking out here. Uh, I don't know when this photo was taken, but there's almost always full of commercial vessels in here, and it and the swell comes in and it, and it's not comfortable. And it was crowded and uncomfortable when we were there, so we only stayed a couple of days. From Rarotonga, we headed west to the island nation of Nui, and this is a, a video I put together of our stay in Nui. This is the mooring field uh, at the island of Nui in the western South Pacific. You can see there's four boats behind us on moorings. There's a total of about 14 moorings here that the new Yacht Club puts out. Looking south here, when we got here yesterday we were the only boat and now there's four others have arrived. Three yesterday and one just this morning. And here looking more towards the east at the island of Nui, you can see it's an uplifted coral island. You know, it's undercut there, it's all coral that you see uplifted. And it's just covered with uh, jungle. You can see the few houses and, and stuff in there. And now we're looking to the east towards the, the pier. You can see that one big pier right ahead of us there. That's the only way to get from a boat or a ship on and off of Nui. You take your dinghy right in there and uh, lift it right out of the water, put it on a dolly, get it out of the way because you can't tie up to that pier. It's too rough. It would destroy your dinghy. Um, and then now looking up to the north, you can see this is kind of a little bay here. Here's some local fishing vessels. They launch their fishing boats the same way, using that, using a hoist there on the pier, and drop them right in the water, go fishing, get home at the end of the day, lift them, lift them right up again. Uh, very steep drop off, so it's very difficult to anchor here, which is why they put in these mooring buoys. And you can see it's an open roadstead. It's pretty rough. We've got our, you can see, our, we've got our flopper stopper out here to stop the boat from rolling itself to death, uh, make it a little more comfortable. But you can see the boats rolling behind us there. This is not a, a good spot. Now this is what, we're in the lee of the island now with these trade winds. You can imagine what it's like when the wind shifts out of the west. You wouldn't want to be here. So this is on the pier there at Nui. You can see the, the crane they've got there that uh, lifts, lifts the boats out. You, you come right in, lift right out because otherwise your boat would be destroyed against the pier. There's no harbor. All goods and materials that um, arrive at, uh, by boat have to be landed this way using that using that hoist, so it's very inefficient. You can see Van, Van Diemen out there on the mooring. No, there's no charge for that. Well, we had to pay to use the mooring out there. Um, but no charge to use the hoist. Here's our, here's our dinghy been pulled out. Uh, from Nui, uh, we headed west to Vavau Tonga, which is one of my favorite uh, places. This is a shot from inside Mariner's Cave. Uh, Mariner's Cave is uh, just a hole in a, in a cliff on the side of this island, and you, you dive down about eight feet and dive in about ten feet, and you get into this big old air bubble in there. And with the swell, that air bubble pressurizes your ears, and it, with each swell, it gets foggy and then clear, and foggy and clear. It's, it's pretty cool, but it's a real 
leap of faith to dive into this black hole in the cliff and hope that there's air inside there. You know, it was it was uh, discovered in the eight, 1700s by a guy named William Mariner, and of course that's long before they had scuba gear. So how he got in here and and found this, you know, on one breath is uh, is an amazing story, I guess. Uh, but it's a must do when you get to Vavau Tonga. Here's a video I put together of another one of my favorite anchorages in Vavau. This is the Hunga Lagoon. It's an absolutely glorious day here in the Hunga Lagoon in Vavau, Tonga. And crystal clear. It was beautiful and cool last night. It's, trades are quite windy, but we're protected here up under this cliff on the eastern side of this mile long by half mile wide lagoon. This is looking out towards the only entrance to the lagoon, a little 150 um, foot wide crack in the cliff. You can see off there in the distance on the western side of the lagoon and now looking down towards the south. There's a, around the corner there, there's a village. We can't see it here and the rest of the lagoon is uninhabited. We've got this part all to ourselves. Looking north and now looking off to the east. We've got this beautiful white sand beach. All to ourselves. We could hear the wind and the trees up on the top of the ridge there last night. And um, but down here we're totally protected. We're going to go into the beach there in a little while and go hiking. There's a nice hike down to the south end of the island. We're anchored in yeah, probably 70, 80 feet of water here. Uh, while we were in the Hunga Lagoon, we got visited by this guy in an outrigger canoe. He comes up, makes friends with us, and after a few minutes he says, uh, are you guys interested in fruit? We said, yeah, you got any papayas? So out of his backpack he pulls some papayas and sells, us to us, sells them to us. And then a few minutes later, uh, someone says, hey, do pearls grow in this lagoon? He says, well, yeah, they do. And, in, and out of his backpack comes uh, pink pearl necklaces, black pearl necklaces, and white pearl necklaces. His backpack reminded me of Mary Poppins' carpet bag. I mean, anything we could dream of, he would pull out of that backpack. Uh, from Vavau, we headed west to uh, uh, Fiji. I'd been to Fiji a couple times before, but I'd never been to the real gems of the group, and that's the Lao group in the east and the Yasawas in the west. And this is Vavatu Bay and the Lao group, just a very stunning anchorage. Around the corner from Bavatu Bay is the Bay of Islands. And this little cruising boat here had a drone on it. So he sent this drone up to get these photos. And here's Van Diemen, an anchor over here in the Bay of Islands, just a stunningly beautiful um, area. It's uplifted coral. So this is a shot from um, Van Diemen looking towards that boat that had the drone. You can see how it's all undercut. It's much like Palau and uh, um, Nui is the same way. Coral got uplifted and it just it gets erodes by the wave action there. Uh, mushrooms, yeah, another shot of the Bay of Islands. Yeah, I mean, there's so many little hidey holes in here. We didn't even realize this boat was here until we saw the photo later on. So, From uh, the Lao group, we headed west to the Asawas and Mamanukas and this video I put together of our stay there. It's a pretty nice beach here at the southern end of Yasawa Island. Van Diemen out there. At lovely Van Diemen at anchor. Not a footprint in the sand except my own. Nice little spot. You can see our dinghy on the beach off there in the distance. And here comes Eric. Here we are powering through typical Yasawas. Little island there with a resort on it. Coming through the channel here between two islands. Way off in the distance there is Viti Levu. And then here on the right, another island with a resort. And 
here we are at Waia. This is the highest and grandest of the Yasawa Islands. And you can see the whole fleet's in here. We've got a total of six other boats we found in here when we got here. It looks like great minds think alike. As you can see the devil's horns ahead of us there. And uh, they're probably all hiding out from the same weather system that we are hiding out from. But we're right now, blue like hell last night, and right now we're in a lull between weather system supposed to blow like hell again from tonight come from the southwest. Here's the village ashore at Waia. Very picturesque little village and look at all our, our speedboats in there. Now the wind is, I'm looking southwest now, this is the direction the wind is supposed to come from tonight which is, we're in a perfect spot. You can see we'll be protected by that hillside there. And here's the shore, the western shore here. And this little peninsula is going to protect us from swell and and wind. A couple other cruising boats at anchor. Here we got our flopper stopper out. Rob's rigging that right now. Stop the rolling if it happens. This is the anchorage at Navadra Island. I'm not sure which one's Navadra. Northernmost of the Mamanukas. One of the cruising guides said this was the author's favorite anchorage in Fiji, and I can see why. It's just beautiful. Nice white sand beaches, protected from everywhere but the north. Really pretty, pretty spot. Clear water, we're anchored in about 70 feet of water, and you can see the bottom like it's 10 feet deep. And we're not the only ones that have this figured out. There are four other cruising boats at anchor here. A couple of mana holes here next to us, looking off to the east and now the north. This is absolutely, without question, the coolest island I have ever seen in my life. I'm inside of a cave here on the beach. And demon on the up there. Yeah, kind of down. This is absolutely the coolest island. There's a forest back here. I just walked through. There's the cave. Look at that. They picked the wrong island to film Castaway. That's where Tom Hanks should have been living. This is just the neatest island ever. Walking out here. See the nice long white sand beach. There's the cave behind us. Another island out there. And the fleet at anchor. What an unbelievable spot. Uh, after our stay at the Yasawas and, and Mamanukas, uh, we had to go into a marina to, uh, to uh, check out. This is the Vunda Point Marina, so we pull up to their visitor's dock, go in and check out with customs, and, and uh, they sang us a song. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, from there we headed uh, uh, west to Norfolk Island, or south to Norfolk Island. Uh, we had a very quick two-day sail down to Norfolk and uh, uh, here we are, we're just arriving at Norfolk. It's October 7th, and Van Diemen is making her landfall here on Norfolk Island. We're just approaching the north side, having spent the last two days sailing down from New Caledonia. And here we are coming into Norfolk for the wind out of the north, which is perfect. Norfolk Island here on the mighty Van Diemen. 
Michael, Sapa, and Robert. Van Diemen's dinghy getting lifted out of the out of the water here. When the mobile crane isn't here, this is how they haul boats and materials out. They use this crane and the wire, you just hook that wire to your your car, the end of the wire, or your truck, and pull on it, and that's how you lift things up and down. This mobile crane is normally not here, only when the ship is here. This is Ball Bay on Norfolk Island's east coast. We came in here at 3 a.m. this morning after being anchored down in Sydney Bay, also called Slaughter Bay, on the south coast of Norfolk Island. A large southwest swell came up in the middle of the night and made it completely unsuitable as an anchorage, so we got the hell out of there before we broke something or harmed the boat. Came down here, and this is well, you can see it's not calm. This is a hell of a lot better than, than uh, Sydney Bay or Slaughter Bay. So this is Norfolk Island. Uh, Norfolk was used as a one of the last of England's uh, penal colonies, and uh, this is some of the ruins from its use as a as a as a penal colony. Uh, Norfolk was also uh, where, uh, as Mac mentioned. Uh, they moved the, uh, about half of the population of Pitcairn Island. Pitcairn became overpopulated in the mid-1800s. Um, so many of the, the current inhabitants of Norfolk Island are descendants of the Bounty Mutineers, and to, including this guy here. This is Jimmy Quintal. Uh, there was a Quintal aboard the Bounty, and one of his ancestors. Jimmy is married to Claire, and Claire is the daughter of two of the crew aboard our boat. This is uh, Zappa and Marie Bell. And uh, so we had an inn on Norfolk Island, a place to stay, a car to use, and someone to show us around. So that made it a lot of fun. Um, also on Norfolk Island, it, uh, you, a visit to the uh, graveyard there is uh, really something. Just walking around reading the headstones, I found two headstones of individuals who were executed uh, for uh, mutiny and uh, another guy who was accidentally killed by a whale. Only I don't know how you can tell it's accidental. And of course, you can see the Norfolk Pines here uh, that are, are, have been relocated all over the world, including here. From Norfolk Island, we headed west to Lord Howe Island, which is also, like, like Norfolk, is a owned, an island owned by Australia. Uh, they use it as a, mostly a resort island, and this is coming around the southern end of the island at their 2,000-foot sea cliffs. Uh, water's pretty cool here. Uh, we're getting pretty far south now. We're probably 30 degrees south, so... It's pretty cool here, but this is the just the the landing here at the pier in Norfolk Island, or excuse me, Lord Howe Island. Uh, just a beautiful spot. There are 200 permanent inhabitants on Lord Howe, and uh, they allow 400 visitors at any one time to come to the island. So it's very very regulated on how many visitors they have. They're trying to, you know keep their island from eroding away like the Lonnie Kite pillboxes from too many visitors and that kind of thing. Yeah, there's hotels. On the pier here at Lord Howe Island, looking south at the mountains, beautiful mountains. Van Diemen's right there in the gap between the two mountains. You're very small, you can see on the water there. And looking out to the west. And to the east, Lord Howe Island, the Van Diemen crew heading ashore. I don't know what is. And here's uh, Michael and I. Michael is a uh, urologist from from uh, Hobart, and he's an avid bird watcher. And Lord Howe is a bird watcher's paradise. And we're up there looking at, yeah, those are uh, red-tailed tropic birds. This is where they where they nest. 
Yeah, quite a few right there in, in Lord Howe. And here we are sailing away from, from Lord Howe, headed towards our next uh, landfall, which is an entry in, into the country of Australia at Newcastle. You're under sail, not We're under sail, yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, the boat does about uh, 10 knots. Um, yeah. And, and it's on autopilot, yeah, auto drives the boat. Uh, we, we made landfall in uh, Newcastle and immediately headed south to uh, Pitwater, where a couple of crew members lived, and we were entertained by hump humpback whales uh, all the way down the coast. In Pitwater, we had to wait for a week and a half to get good weather to head for Hobart, and uh, while there, we were invited to a long lunch. When an Australian invites you to a long lunch, you got to be careful because you sit down at noon, and out comes the food, and out comes the wine, and you don't get up until it's dark, and it's very painful the next day. Uh, we finally got our weather window after a week and a half, and and three days later, we were at sunrise, we're rounding Tasman Island at the southeast corner of Tasmania. Just a couple of miles past Tasman Island is Cape Raoul, and these are uh, dolomite columns um, there at Cape Raoul. Uh, they're just stunningly beautiful, so I got this video as we went by. About a week later, Lori and I were up on top of Cape Raoul looking down the other direction. Yeah, just beautiful geology. Just really something and you can just just as we get to the end of the video here you can see uh, Tasman Island off here off here on the right a couple hours later we're tied up to the dock at the Royal Yacht Club of Tasmania and Van Diemen's voyage is over it's interesting that three days later uh, a front came through and this green bow line here broke and the back of the boat got scuffed up on the dock so after you know 10,000 miles and six months of, of dangerous anchorages, the boat gets damaged, tied up to the marina in Hobart. In that, spot. in that spot. Yeah, yeah. Believe it or not, it failed at a splice, which is very unusual. So a week later, my loving and tolerant wife, Lori, who encourages me to go on these adventures, joined me in Tasmania, and we spent the next um, uh, month exploring Tasmania and uh, New South Wales. Here's Lori at uh, Wineglass Bay, Friesenay National Park, but that's another story, and we'll save that for later. Thank you all very much, and I, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you, you, you know what this is? The EAH Certificate of Appreciation for you, it should be Sustained Superior Achievement since I probably our populace at least six times, second only to your father in law. <laughs> and this record will never be broken, ever, even by Tom Brady. <laughs> and we miss him. Yeah. Good job, sir. Thank you. Engineers and architects of Hawaii welcome your comments on this program and any of our recent programs. We encourage your direct participation in this community outreach. So please email us your comments and ideas at eahawaii at gmail.com.